Let's continue this video series by pinpointing the exact problems in Einstein's special relativity paper. The math needed to understand this is very basic. Distance equals rate times time, and that's it. So from the previous relativity myth video, we learned that the only thing Einstein really did was take Lorentz's moving clock and turn it into a true or real time. And from the twins paradox video, we learned that when you take that new real moving clock and pair it with the principle of relativity, it's incompatible because it creates the famous clock paradox. Now, here is what we are going to focus on in this video. We are going to continually ask, what is the physical reality of making this moving clock another real time or true time? This is Einstein's 1907 statement about what he did in his special relativity paper. So, what is the physical reality of Einstein's new conception of time? It makes one light pulse event somehow become two light pulse events. When the moving frame plays the exact same part as the stationary frame, you get this. And this is what the 1 equals 2 is all about. Walking through the first three sections of Einstein's special relativity paper will show you the errors he made to come to this conclusion. Let's look at a demonstration that helps explain this 1 equals 2 problem. As you know from the previous video, Einstein's equations were taken from Voldemir Voigt. Voigt derived these equations from the Doppler effect and oscillations in a medium. So it really shouldn't be a stretch to use a Doppler effect demo to try to give an analogy of this 1 equals 2 idea. So the moving frame of the car is creating a note of F. This is the true note that is being made by the trumpet. Apparently, the stationary observer at the roadside is hearing an F-sharp note. Even though we have two different notes in this example, the physical reality is that there's only one note being played, and this is the true note. Now, Einstein's physics wants this F-sharp note to also be a correct answer. Not just apparently, but real or true. And the physical reality for that to happen would mean that this trumpet must be playing two different tones at once, or there's a second trumpet in there playing that F-sharp. Hopefully that analogy makes some sense. Einstein wants both of these clocks to be equally valid and real. And when we look at his paper, he uses the idea of a light pulse clock to try to convince us that 1 equals 2. Before we review Einstein's paper, let's take a look at where he got his relativity ideas. This will help us better understand the design behind his special relativity paper. So, Einstein's best thought experiment was to read this paper from Henry Poincaré. Let's look at this 1905 translation of Poincaré's World's Fair speech. At the time, Poincaré was the leader in this idea of the principle of relativity. So in his speech, he was kind of venting his frustration right here. Velocity in relation to the ether. How unsatisfactory that is. So what does this mean? Quick analogy. The speedometer in your car is showing you your velocity in relation to the ground, which is at rest. So instead of the ground being at rest, we have the fluid that fills all of space. 
and that is the ether. Because velocity is always relative to the ether, Poincaré's frustration here is that the principle of relativity will always kind of be half throttle. You're always relative to the ether. So what did Einstein do about this? He just got rid of the ether and replaced it with something called empty space. This sounds logical, but now instead of having your velocity relative to the ground or the ether that fills space, your velocity is only calculated relative to other objects that are inside of empty space. And now we are in Einstein's world, where relativity is at full throttle. So then Poincaré went on and discussed the idea of the velocity of light becoming an impassable limit. I think you can see that Einstein read this paper. Otherwise, Poincaré was some kind of a prophet that could foretell the future. Anyway, what Einstein did here was replace the ether waves of the ether medium with projectile light particles, or light quanta, we now call photons. Now, when we say speed of light, instead of it being the speed of a wave in a medium, it is the speed of a projectile particle of light through empty space. Einstein needed this photon idea to be in place before his relativity paper was published. This paper is known as Einstein's photoelectric effect paper, and this is where he introduced the photon just two months prior to publishing the relativity theory. So let's take a quick look at how Einstein came up with the idea of the photon. First, he introduces the illogical idea of something we call wave-particle duality. This idea still plagues science today, and it's all in these two paragraphs. The basic idea is this. The wave theory of light will probably never be replaced by another theory. But a light ray consists of a finite number of these little tiny energy quanta that can only be absorbed or generated as a whole. Now that sounds great, but the basic illogic is if you generate a particle of light, then how in the world does it ever become a wave in a medium and then go back to a particle and be absorbed? By making this statement, you basically contradict the idea that the wave theory of light will never be replaced by another theory. So here we have another example of Einstein's mind virus. He has two opposite ways of viewing light, but only requires one, because he's getting rid of the waves in the ether when it comes to his special relativity theory. Einstein had previously worked on a light particle theory, and I'll use this reference. He had to abandon this light particle theory because these projectile particles wouldn't work. But now he has empty space for the projectiles, and people can still think about waves. That's awesome! So where did Einstein get the math to describe this new projectile photon? He reused a key portion of Max Planck's mathematics from the blackbody radiation experiment. And here's a quick walkthrough of Einstein's photon math. So I'll show you how this turns into HV. First, we have to figure out what Rn is. In the first section of this paper, we find Rn. R is the universal gas constant. N is now known as the Avogadro's number. To figure out what this means, we need to go look back at another Max Planck paper. On page 6, you'll see right here is Avogadro's number. If you fit that into this equation, you'll find that R over N 
is actually equal to K, which is Boltzmann's constant. So back to the photoelectric equation, we need to figure out what beta is. So in section two of Einstein's paper, beta is equal to this number. We have to go back to Planck's 1901 paper to see that h over k is equal to this number. And that is what beta is in Albert Einstein's paper. So if Rn is equal to k, or the Boltzmann's constant, and beta is equal to h over the Boltzmann's constant, then the k's cancel out and you're just left with hv. Okay, so from that quantum flaw video, you saw that Einstein reused Max Planck's math for his photon. And Max Planck's math was based on a black body radiation experiment that was sampling one second's worth of data in order to get that equation that creates a whole other issue with Einstein's one second photon problem. One last thing about the photon. Let me show you something from this article. Max Planck and these other scientists were recommending Einstein into a German Academy of Sciences. It goes on to say that he may sometimes have missed the target in his speculations. As for example, in his hypothesis of light quanta, that's his photon, and it cannot really be held too much against him. See, this is interesting because now we take this photon idea for granted, whereas back in the day, the contemporary scientists completely rejected it. Okay, so now you see how Einstein has created his new idea of space. Velocity is in meters per second or space over time and the space portion of velocity which used to be filled with ether in Einstein's world he just got rid of it and now it's empty space. He had to create the projectile photon light particle to go through empty space in order to explain how light works. So he's halfway there. He's taking care of space. Now he needs to take care of time. How is he going to justify that per second portion or that time portion of velocity in relation to the ether? Einstein must get rid of this idea of a single universal based clock.